Hello and welcome into another episode of Lockdown Wolves. Today on the show, we're kicking off What If Week today. Some team what ifs. What if the Wolves get off to a horrible start this season? What happens? What if the Timberwolves go to the finals this year? What impact will that have on the roster? And what if Glenn Taylor remains the majority owner? It's all upcoming on the show here today. Welcome in. You are Lockdown Wolves. You are Locked On Timberwolves, your daily Minnesota Timberwolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hello and welcome to the Locked On Wolves podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. My name is Ben Beacon. I am the host of Locked On Wolves. Today's episode is brought to us by FanDuel, now through September 22nd. That's just under a week from now. All FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday Ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. Visit FanDuel.com to get started. Happy Monday, everybody. Hopefully you had a fantastic weekend. Uh, Today, we are kicking off What If Week. We're going to spend the majority of this week talking about what ifs for the season. First for the team, team performance, team success, team ownership. And then we'll go through the roster and talk about some individual player what ifs. Like we'll pull out like what if uh, Jane McDaniels becomes an all-star? What if, you know, Anthony Edwards, you know, we'll, we'll talk about some specific stats and like what that domino effect could be on the team, right? We'll, we'll do that throughout the week. Today, though, I want to hit some bigger picture what ifs, some pretty interesting scenarios that, you know, obviously some best case and some worst case scenarios that that could play out for the Wolves this year. Um, what 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 does Timberwolves world look like? What does this world look like if certain things happen, especially early on in the season? So we'll dive into that here today. Big thank you off the top for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every single day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on both Roku and Amazon Fire TV. All right. So kicking off what if week, we're gonna we're gonna start big. And, and by big, I mean like what's what's the doomsday scenario for this Timberwolves team? I think this is a valid conversation and could completely like if you were to simulate this upcoming season a hundred times, like so many of the possible outcomes are very positive. And what I mean by that is barring catastrophic injury, which we, we like, that's part of this exercise. Like, like obviously hope that doesn't happen to anybody. Well, to anybody period, but you know, any, any player that's vital to the team's success this year that they're counting on. But besides that, it's hard to see this team regressing significantly. And we've talked a little bit about that in the past and we'll get into a bit today too. Um, but what if the worst happens? What if for some reason, like, you know, Rudy comes back and he's a little dinged up and they're up out of sync as a team as they were at the start of the year two years ago, year one of Rudy Gobert on the Wolves? What if um, Anthony Edwards has an Olympics hangover and just isn't the guy he needs to be over the first month and a half, two months of the season? What if this team's hovering around the 500 mark around January 1st? That's a pretty nightmare scenario, which is, by the way, As terrible as that would be, because it would be miserable if the Wolves are at 500 on January 1st, given the conference finals appearance last year and the expectations for this team. But just a side note, if you've been a Timberwolves fan for a long time, that's not a bad worst case scenario. Uh, Or, you know, like, like that's actually probably the worst worst case, because then you have to really look at blowing this team up. And, And by blowing this team up, I obviously don't mean trading Anthony Edwards but there's a lot of other ways that they could go about it. We'll talk about that here in a minute. Uh, another horrible case scenario would be significant injury to anybody, but certainly Anthony Edwards, Carl Anthony Towns, Rudy Gobert. If any one of those guys misses significant time and this team is stumbling around at January on January 1st, on or around the holidays, um, what happens next? Where does this team go from there? What's looming over this team? Well, everybody knows about the luxury tax being the thing. The Timberwolves are, have blown past the second apron. If they make no changes to the roster between now and the end of the season, the Timberwolves will have a luxury bill of over $100 million. $100 million plus, it's something like $105, $107 million in luxury tax payments based on their current roster that they would owe. It doesn't get calculated until the last day. Of the, I think it's the regular season. So they could make moves along the way, but that's the point I'm making is that if things are have gone terribly awry, 
and call it early mid January, this teams are on, you know, around the 500 mark or, and whether that's just team performance or somebody's hurt, does Tim Connolly look at trading Nas Reed or trading Carlton Towns or seriously look at trading Rudy Gobert? Although his return would surely be less than the other two guys, especially given Rudy's upcoming player option next summer. We'll talk more about that too today. Those are the obvious answers as to what could happen. Like, let's say they're completely healthy, but Cat doesn't shoot it well from three, and Rudy doesn't contribute offensively, and the offense remains in the bottom half of the league. The defense is good, but not great. And, and they're like, I don't know, 20 and 18 or something like that, was they're nearing the midway point of the season. What does Tim Connolly do? We're going to talk about the ownership stuff at the end of the show today in the final segment, because that, by the way, that those things start to happen. Those meetings, those arbitration conversations happen in November, December. So that's going to have some impact too, but let's set that aside for now and say this team's performance is mediocre at best and certainly underwhelming compared to, you know, relative to the expectations coming into this season. Do the Timberwolves look at trading Carl Anthony Towns? Cat's going to make over $49 million this year. He's going to make $53 million in 2526. He's going to make $57 million in 2627. And he has a player option for the 27 28 season. If he opted in, he'd be making $61 million that year. And he'll be about to turn 30 or he'll turn 33 during that season. I'm sorry. He'll turn 32 during that season, I believe. So do they look at trading Carl Anthony Towns to lessen, to try and get under the tax line, first of all? Which, which I, I guess would still be possible. Um, eh, I think they might actually need to do more than move Carl Anthony Towns to get underneath it. Um, but that would go a long way. And it would at least reduce the tax bill significantly. Um, they could look at that. They could look at trading Nas Reed. Because again, remember, it counts that much more. When you're over that second apron, it's more than just dollar for dollar in terms of what you're saving with the, with the penalties. So if they can get below that second apron and Nas moving Nas Reed would get them down the path of doing that. Nas makes about 14 million this year. He's got a player option for 15 million next year and sitting here right now, unless Nas gets hurt or has a much, much worse year this year, we're talking about the reigning sixth man of the year. He's going to opt out after this season and he's going to want to make more money. And I know last time he took probably a little bit less as has been reported to stay in Minnesota. The fans love him. He loves the fans. Trading Nas would be a really, really tough thing. And I think target center would be met with pitchforks and torches, uh, or the fans would, would, would march on target center with pitchforks and torches. Um, due to the, you know, popularity of Nas Reed. If this team's struggling, Nas could walk for nothing in the summer. Now, because of that, there's also the chance that maybe he's the, the trade value is a little bit lower because teams don't want to risk him walking. But of course, Nas could also agree to an extension with whoever he's traded to because that team would assume his bird rights. So there's a real chance that if this team's struggling, I call it the turn of the calendar to January, that Nas and Cat would be the two guys who are most likely to be traded. Less likely would be Jaden McDaniels. He, of course, makes in between those two. He's making $23 million this year, goes up to 25 next year. But he's got a you know five years upcoming on his deal that he just signed. He, if he continues to improve, he's going to outpace the value of that deal. Sitting here right now, he actually provides the the let the least amount of on court value relative to his deal. I, I know that there's people that would argue with me about Cat on that. But I think Cat at $49 million actually gives you more than Jaden McDaniels does at about half that number. Because Jaden is right now still a net negative offensively. He's just he's impactful enough defensively, but they've still got enough other defenders between Ant and Nikhil Alexander Walker. But of course, this is this is part of the next conversation. Nikhil Alexander Walker is a free agent this summer, too. So like as soon as you lose him, Jaden becomes that much more valuable. So I think it's really unlikely. All that to say they trade Jaden. I do think it's much more likely. I think Cat's the first one to go. Nas would be next in line. I don't think they'd be able to trade Rudy and get anything approaching requisite value back. I think Jaden's really unlikely to be traded. And that's kind of it. Take out Mike Conley, who's wor who you know makes $10 million and, and is going to retire in the next two years. They're not going to trade him. Rob Dillingham is the only other guy that makes more than $4 million bucks on this team, and they're not trading him this season. So your, your options are Cat, and they're not trading Ant, obviously. So Cat's number one. 
Nas is probably the second one. Jaden would be the third one. And I don't think anyone else has a real shot at being traded this year. So ignore any cat rumors you hear now. They're not moving him right now. But if this team struggles to a 500 start, and I'm not talking about like at Thanksgiving, if they're at 500, although it would certainly be alarming, but I'm talking Christmas or later, those are the, when those rumors would start to become real. What's that nightmare scenario? And how quickly does this team backpedal? How quickly does Tim Connolly say, let's pull the shoot. Let's save the luxury tax. Let's save this, this, uh, you know, multiple dollars on the dollar situation, this repeater tax, or, or I guess it would be a repeater tax if this happens again next year. Let's save this tax bill by trading Carl Anthony Towns because it's only going to get more expensive as his contract gets more expensive. Now, there's also the Rudy extension, which we'll talk more about here in a minute because that possibility could could impact this too. So let's go ahead and get into that. I, I do want to get into the question of what if the Timberwolves go to the finals? How does that change their approach next summer? You know, just uh, believe it or not, next summer, next offseason is only nine months away from now. So how would their approach change if they went to or won the NBA Finals? We'll talk about that here next. Today's episode of Lockdown Wolves is brought to us by our title sponsors at FanDuel. You've heard me talk a lot about FanDuel here at Lockdown Wolves. That's because it's America's number one sportsbook. They're offering something a little bit different for you right now. Through September 22nd, that's next Sunday. So next Sunday's football game is just six days from now. All FanDuel customers can bet $5 and get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. And then with the YouTube TV base plan, you'll be able to watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game. All you need is a Google account and a current form of payment. You can cancel at any time. Again, now is the time to do it. It's football season. We're just going into week three of the NFL. Week, what, four-ish, four and a half of college football um, again, now through this coming Sunday, the 22nd, all FanDuel customers can bet just five bucks. You'll get a three-week free trial of NFL Sunday ticket from YouTube and YouTube TV. You can watch every regular season Sunday afternoon out-of-market game as long as you have a YouTube TV base plan. All you need is a Google account, a current form of payment, and you can cancel at any time. Just visit FanDuel.com, download America's number one sportsbook. A big thank you once again for making Locked on Wolves your first listen of the day. Now, for your second listen, enjoy the Locked on NBA podcast. There's no offseason in the NBA, and Locked on NBA provides daily basketball analysis from national and local experts in 30 minutes or less. No one keeps you as informed and entertained as Locked on NBA. Available on YouTube or wherever you get podcasts, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. All right, so we've covered the worst case scenario. If this team's languishing around 500, when the calendar flips to 2025, what happens? Who's most likely to be traded? Do they pull the shoot? And how quickly do they pull the shoot? On the flip side of the coin, if this Timberwolves team goes to the finals, or I can't believe I'm saying this with a straight face, but if they win the finals, I can't say it with a straight face. I had to smile because uh, how crazy is that? Is that phrase? Um, but if they were to win the finals, what changes with this team's offseason next year? So painting the picture of next offseason, Rudy Gobert has a player option for next year. Nas Reed has a player option for next year. Uh, currently, Rudy Gobert is extension eligible. Nas Reed will be following this season if he were to opt in to the, uh, to the player option with the player option. Nikhil Alexander Walker is an unrestricted free agent. Joe Ingles, of course, will be an unrestricted free agent and uh, much less important. Sorry, PJ. PJ Dozier will also be a free agent. That's the cap situation. The team will have options on Luca Garza and on Josh Minot. The Minot one, I believe, is the one they've got to um, make that decision. Oh, no, I'm wrong. I was thinking they had to make that decision this October, but that's not the case because he did not. He was not a first round pick. So it was a uh, the, the, the team got to essentially. It's different than an extension eligible rookie or a, a rookie that has the, a first round pick that has those player options, excuse me, team options. Those are club options that have to be activated by the end of October. This is different as a second round pick. The contract might not sign his club options actually next June. So basically the week of the draft next year, Minot and Garza, the team would have options on those. They're each uh, like two. Let's see. Garza is about 2.3 million. Minot's about 2.2 ish million. So, your unrestricted free agents, Dekele Alexander Walker, Joe Ingles, PJ Dozier, your player options, Rudy Gobert and Nas Reed. Cats' salary goes up about four million. Ants goes up about three and a half million. 
Jaden's goes up about two million. Mike Conley's goes up almost a million dollars. What happens if the Timberwolves win the finals? Well, first and foremost, would Mike Conley just retire? Remember, Conley will be 38. He'll turn 38 uh, next year. And he's he just signed a two-year extension. So he's under contract for just under $10 million. This year, about 10.7, almost 10.8 the following year. But if the Timberwolves win the finals, does Mike Conley just say, hey, let's hang it up? Might be like, if he has a great season, the Timberwolves may prefer that he comes back to try and defend their title or, or win the finals if they lose in the finals. Like, that could be the difference, honestly. Like, if Mike Conley, say he has a similar season like he did last year where it was great, he just wore down a little at the end, and they lose in the finals, I bet he comes back for $11 million the next year. And the Timberwolves would say, we'd love to have you back. But if they win the finals, Conley may hang him up. Or if he has a poor season, his body breaks down or whatever, and they win or lose in the finals, he also might retire. I think if they have a mediocre season, that's obviously still on the table, but um, I kind of think that if they win the finals, he may just hang them up. So that's maybe the first thing that happens is, is, is Mike Conley retiring. And then, of course, related to that is, is Rob Dillingham ready to step in and be the starting point guard? Now, we have no idea right now what that's going to look like 12 months from now, nine months from now. But that that's a related question. If the Timberwolves win the finals, the answer is probably yeah to both of those things, right? Like Mike Conley probably retires and Rob Dillingham probably had a pretty good season. And of course, if Conley retires, then you you have uh, a little bit of breathing room there that almost 11 million comes off the books. But is Dillingham ready to step in and be the starting point guard next fall? The other thing is if they win the finals, does it make them more likely to just be like, hey, look, we don't need to make a change. We we might we won the finals, but like we won the finals. So we're not going to bend over backwards to avoid the luxury tax. We're going to just absorb Cat's, you know, uh, his raise of $4 million. Obviously, the cap will go up as well. We don't know how much, but the cap will go up a little bit. We'll just kind of run it back and we'll pay the tax bill because we're the champs and, and we want to defend our title. It's probably more likely they do that versus what we talked about in segment one. If the Timberwolves are, you know, 500 at, on January 15th, they're pretty unlikely to be like, yeah, let's keep paying the tax next year. Whether or not they trade cat in season next, next uh, July, they're not going to say, yeah, you know what? We only won 45 games and lost in the first round. Let's run it back and pay this massive tax bill. No, I think it's much more likely cats traded, but if they win the finals, they may say, screw it. We just won the finals. Let's run it back. Let's pay this bill related to that. Would they just say, Let's keep Nikhil Alexander Walker because you can, you could, if you're already over that second apron, you can sign, you can only sign free agents, unrestricted free agents to the vet minimum, but you could pay more than that to retain your own players. So Nikhil is only getting paid 4.3 million this year, second year of a two year deal that he signed last offseason to come back to Minnesota. Right now, if he were a free agent, that dude would have gotten more than the mid level exception this year. He's probably a 10, 12, $14 million player. Maybe not that much, probably 10, 12 million. So if Nikhil has a similar season this year as he did last year, he shoots the ball well, he's great defensively, he's only going to be entering his prime. He'll be like 27 next summer. If he has a similar season, he's going to get 10 million plus multi-year deal on the market, on the, on the open market. Would the Timberwolves go further over the cap, further into the luxury tax, further over the second apron to bring back to kill Alexander Walker if they go to the finals and don't win or go to the finals and win. Again, that may not be the same answer. If they go to the finals and lose, they may say, we got to run it back. Or they may say, we got to make some tweaks because we didn't quite win it all. If they win, same deal. Like they, This may be one of those fringe moves that's like, ah, do we really pay $10 million for Alexander Walker with which all the penalties is, is more than twice that in, in actuality in terms of what's coming out of our owner's pocketbook? Let's go find a, an equivalent player in the draft or in, uh, on a vet minimum. I don't know. But that at least would enter the conversation. Whereas, say the Timberwolves have just the same season as last year and they go to the conference finals or lose in the second round and they win 50 plus games the regular season. It's a very similar year, but they don't win or go to the finals. They probably let Alexander Walker walk because of all the, the severe penalties of, of signing these guys when you're above the second apron. So I, I think that's another thing that that definitely enters into the equation. And then, of course, there's the Nas Reed thing, too. Do they go further into the tax and extend Nas Reed? Would he opt out of his $15 million for next year and say, hey, look, I, you know, I want to stay here, but I need $20 million plus or whatever that might be. And same with Rudy. 
I talked about this on a previous show, but Rudy is making 44 million this year. His player option for next season will be 46, a little over 46 and a half million. I think both sides would benefit from him opting out and signing a, or, or I guess he wouldn't have to opt out. He could sign it now. He is extension eligible and call it, I don't know what the number will be, but call it 27 million ish um, a year. Maybe just because that's his jersey number. I don't know where I pulled that from. Uh, you know, anywhere from 25 to 30 million, probably less than 30 million a year, uh, and, and maybe the next three years. So instead of just one more year at 47 million, they lessen the tax bill by dropping it. Maybe the first year is under 30 million and it goes up with the cap. And Rudy then gets his extension that gets him to like age 35. And, and at that point, he could think about retiring or come back on a smaller deal. But this gets him through the rest of, we'll call it what he's still in his prime. I, I, I think that's fair, uh, to the tail end of his prime. So it's mutually beneficial because the Wolves know what that cost is going to be for the next several seasons. They lower their tax bill for the next couple of years. And Rudy has the security because what happens if he goes into the season and God forbid he has a serious injury? You know, he, he tears his knee up or something like that. Well, first of all, he's going to opt in for next year and get 47 million. So it's in the Wolves best interest to get this done. But second of all, he's probably not getting another long term deal after that unless he comes back in ridiculous shape or whatever. Like you're talking about a 34 year old center who's coming off a severe injury that already was limited offensively and, and isn't going to be able to shoot. It can't shoot. Like he's not going to get another multi-year deal, at least not another lucrative one. So it's mutually beneficial to get an extension done. And it's probably more likely it happens if they go to the finals. I think all of these decisions can be influenced by this. Well, there's only so many things the Wolves can do to the roster. We established this already. Like they're not trading. They probably can't trade Rudy. They're not trading Ant or Jaden. They're not going to trade Mike Conley all for different reasons, of course, but they're not doing it. And that leaves Cat and Nas as trade options. They don't want to trade Nas. They don't really want to trade Cat. There's nobody else that's really worth anything on the trade market. And the Wolves can't take back multiple players and they can't take back, take more salary on. So there's very limited things they can do. But depending on the team's path this season, if they're 500 or win 60 games or go to the finals or whatever, like there's a broad within that. There's different things that can, you know, if, if things go right or wrong during the season, these, these, seemingly small moves become magnified um, and, and being over the second apron is, is the reason for that. All right. I want to talk about the ownership stuff. It's been a little while since we've talked about it. I think that that is kind of low key during the season. What's going to impact. Not really low key. We just, I don't just, it's not fun to talk about, but like we have to be aware of like, what are the possibilities here? If depending on the outcome of the ownership arbitration in November and into December, what is the impact on the Wolves next summer, next offseason? Because that could be the biggest thing, regardless of team success. Maybe not completely regardless of it, but maybe even more so than team success or lack thereof. That, that may be the biggest thing to keep an eye on here moving forward. We'll talk about that here next. Okay, so a refresher on the ownership situation. There's an arbitration hearing between Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez and Glenn Taylor in early November. I don't believe there's a date on it, but we're only, you know, probably at this point, two months, less than two months away from the arbitration hearing. The arbitration hearing apparently will last a week. There's a three member arbitration panel. Each side, the Taylor Laurie, excuse me, the Taylor side and the Laurie Rodriguez side picked an arbitration member, a member of this panel, and then a third member they mutually agreed upon. They'll have a week long hearing. And then within 30 days of that, there will be a ruling. Now, remember that mediation back in May didn't work. And so now this is this is where we're at. So that means if we have early November, we have a week and we have 30 days. So we'll call it roughly December 15th is when we'll get a, get a, uh, a ruling on this. If the panel rules in, in favor of Glenn Taylor, he gets to keep majority ownership of the team. They could just outright rule for Lorian Rodriguez, or I guess, I guess the question is whether or not they des they deserve isn't the right word, whether they were eligible for a, an extension. Um, and the league could say, or the, I'm sorry, not the league, the um, arbitration panel could say Glenn Taylor must sell them the team based on their agreement. And, and that's obviously the outcome that Lorian Rodriguez want. The undercurrent of this whole thing is 
remember, Tim Connolly could have opted out of his contract this last summer. He had an opt-out in his deal. Instead, he kicked the opt-out opt out to next summer. And while nobody's explicitly said this because you, you don't want to, the implication there is he wants to see how this ownership thing plays out. If Lorraine Rodriguez win, I'm sure Tim Connolly may still opt out. I should say I'm sure. It's possible Tim Connolly would still, uh, likely, he'd still opt out and he would just sign a more lucrative contract, an extension to stay in Minnesota. They'd rip up his old contract to give him a new one, which some people thought he'd do this offseason. But if Glenn Taylor wins, he may still do that and I'm sure would still entertain the possibility of staying, but he certainly has more leverage than and more reason to just be like, hey, look, I'm going to go work somewhere else because I don't want to work for Glenn Taylor. Now, he hasn't said that. I'm putting words in his mouth, but that's a real possibility. And clearly him, instead of just straight opting in and, and, and the, you know, instead of opting, like just bypassing the opt out, kicking it a year implies that there's some stuff he wants to see how it shakes out. And this is the most obvious thing. Who's going to be his actual direct boss. Is it Glenn Taylor or is it Mark Laurie and Alex Rodriguez? Given what we know about Laurie and Rodriguez being the ones that pushed for the hiring of Tim Connolly and orchestrated that uh, deal, really, to bring him to Minnesota from Denver, and then in the wake of that, the Rudy Gobert deal, and they were the driving force behind it, seems pretty likely that Tim Connolly would prefer that they win this arbitration hearing in November. What impact will that have on this season? Well, if Glenn Taylor wins, I, like, again, it, it's all tied together, so it's going to depend on team success at some point. But let's say Tim Connolly leaves next summer because let's say he let's say uh, Glenn Taylor wins, the Timberwolves lose in the playoffs before the finals. Tim Connolly probably takes more money to go somewhere else. Probably opts out. Maybe tries to negotiate a bigger deal. Does Glenn Taylor decide to keep Tim Connolly or, or pony up to keep him? And if all things are equal, then the tie you know is Tim Connolly's tiebreaker. Hey, I don't want to move my family again, and I like Minnesota. So if I get the same money here, I'll, I'll just deal with working for Glenn Taylor. Or is it, I don't want to work for Glenn Taylor. I'll take the same money to run the Wizards where I started my career or, or you know, some other team. We don't know. We don't know how that's going to get, all get weighed out. Uh, does it make it more likely that Mike Conley retires? I don't know. I don't know how much Mike Conley cares who the owner is. But if Tim Conley leaves, maybe Mike Conley retires. That matters too. Now you need a starting point guard if Rob Dillingham's not ready. Uh, or are they just not likely to pay the luxury tax? Now, if 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 uh, Glenn Taylor wins and Tim Connolly knows, hey, I'm leaving next summer anyway, Tim Connolly may say, screw it. I'm not going to trade Carl Anthony Towns. It's not my money. You know, I, I'm not going to bother m making a trade here. I'm just going to roll with it and see what happens in the playoffs. But then Tim Connolly leaves and Glenn Taylor may say, hey, look, to whoever's in charge, trade Carl Anthony Towns. Trade, you know, let Nas Reed walk. Trade Jaden McDaniels, whatever you got to do to get under the second apron. I don't know for sure, but like that's that's a legit what if here. If if uh, Laurie and Enriquez don't become majority owners, does Glenn Taylor strong arm whoever replaces Connolly if Connolly leaves? Like this is a very quick. It's not hard to see this path of dominoes fall. It's really not. I'm not. I'm not. This isn't a crazy what if. This is the nightmare scenario. The nightmare scenario is Glenn Taylor winning, the Timberwolves having a bad season, and Tim Connolly leaving. Next offseason, and then pocketbooks, the, the the second apron, are what make all of the decisions in the front office. Not to mention, you have one of the best front office executives in the league who's now left you in Tim Connolly. And while Sasha Gupta is great, and you know who knows whether or not he would still be here or not at that point, like they, they've got other guys, but like how many guys would just leave with Tim Connolly? Um, what does this thing look like? If, 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 if that's indeed what happens. So that's the first domino to all these what ifs, even though I started with like team performance, because I mean, I guess if you get to that point and this team's under 500, then the whole sky is falling at that point. But what happened now, if Lorian Enriquez win could get weird in terms of Glenn Taylor and him still being a minority owner and the whole thing, that'd be very weird at this point with how, how bad the blood is between the, these two groups. But does everything just move forward all hunky dory? And Tim Connolly signed an extension next summer, and and uh, this team continues to pay the luxury tax. Mark Lori, you know, uh, now uh, Mayor Michael Bloomberg is is part of the ownership group, so in theory they have plenty of cash as needed moving forward. Like, 
I don't know. There's a whole other layer of dominoes here, depending on which side wins. But the scary one is if Glenn Taylor wins and the first domino is Tim Connolly saying, look, peace, I'm out. I'm going to take my talents and go somewhere else. Take the front office with me. And then Glenn Taylor forces player movement to, to, to save on cash. We'll see. That's the what ifs. I mean, like, we started with the this was this was the opposite of a of a of a positive what is it the uh the or, like oreo um oreo compliments or, or feedback or whatever where where you give like a, a compliment sandwich where you say something nice say something not nice say something nice this is the opposite we started with a on a bad note like what happens if this team gets off to a bad start gave you the the i guess the the middle of the oreo in the middle of the show of like hey look this team wins the finals then what and then, of course, the worst case scenario in all this, the doomsday scenario is, is Glenn Taylor maintaining majority ownership because of the domino effect it would have on Tim Connolly and the rest of the front office and ultimately maybe even the coaching staff, but certainly the players that this team has uh, at its employ. Okay, we'll continue what if week. It won't always, it won't be this sad all week. We're going to talk about some really positive what ifs. We're going to talk about, you know, uh, Ant's like, what if Ant just explodes and becomes a top three, top five player, a, a true MVP candidate? We'll talk about Carlton Towns offensive numbers. We'll talk about uh, Rudy Gobert. Um, we'll talk about Rob Dillingham, like lots of what if scenarios this year that are going to be a lot of fun. Uh, we'll get into all that throughout the week. We are back daily Monday through Friday. So we'll have a show tomorrow on Tuesday as we get into some, eventually some player previews. First preseason game is two weeks from Friday. You heard that right. Two weeks from Friday is the first preseason game. So, Lots to get to here in the coming days and weeks. A big thank you for making Lockdown Wolves your first listen every day. Of course, this show is free and available everywhere. That includes YouTube as well as all of your favorite audio platforms. Wherever you like to listen to podcasts, you can find Lockdown Wolves. You can also watch on the Lockdown Sports Minnesota app on Roku and Amazon at Fire TV. And you can follow on X at Lockdown T Wolves and also at B Beacon with two B's, two E's, C K. Ian. Of course, for your second listen, go check out Lockdown NBA, where the local experts keep you updated daily on all the biggest storylines ahead of the season. Find Lockdown NBA on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts. Once again, I'm Ben Beacon. This is the Lockdown Wolves podcast, and we'll catch you next time.